This is the Umbrella Academy on TV Podcast Industries. We're discussing Umbrella Academy Season 2, Episode 2, The Frankel Footage. Where did you get the film? The Frankel Footage. The truth this time. You know this lunatic? No acquaintance. He's harmless. Are you sure about that? Are you or are you not an enemy of the people? Well, that's such an open really question on the if you think about it. Yeah. You move one more muscle, I will blow your brains out. You want to take this or should I? Oh, I got him. Hey, Lila. <laughs> what the hell just happened? Welcome back, fellow Academy alumni. This is TV Podcast Industries. We're back with Umbrella Academy Season 2, Episode 2, The Frankel Footage. I'm one of your hosts, Derek. Hello there, fellow Broly Dollies. How are you doing? And just a quick question. How did yogurt know when to stop being milk? That is the question <laughs> for this podcast. Um, I am one of your other hosts, John. And rounding out this trio, I am Chris. And I really don't know. <laughs> You're going to have to ask the milk itself. It's a kind of it's kind of like a glow up, isn't it? Exactly. That is the pub quiz question. No, it's um, not. so you better start thinking, ladies and gentlemen. I wonder <laughs> if uh, if you do answer that question, if you want to email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries dot com with your answer as to why uh, milk decided to be yogurt. Um, yeah, I think we could probably give you a good prize if you uh, if you come up with a good answer to that. What do you think? <laughs> well, I think it's a superpower. I think, it might yeah, be. I, I think I, I, like at a certain point in time. 43 milks were cho- chosen across the world <laughs> to become yogurts, and that's just what they are. Now. All well, milked at exactly the same time. Yeah. It yeah. is ultimately the chemical reaction of an acid um, to curdle the okay, milk. Okay, So um, you could actually probably work it out um, in terms of when it happened, but whether milk is sentient enough to know to to do it i doubt that very much right so but, we're looking um, we're looking for a much more interesting answer than that yeah for to win a prize if and you we'll, have an exciting and fun answer to that rather than the actual chemical reaction i'd love to hear that it. is true and the, <laughs> the the prize could be like a six pack of yacht plate or petty for Lou. <laughs> well <laughs> since we're usually posting it rather than dropping it to people's doors i'm not too sure about sending yogurt through the post <laughs> so uh, so maybe not that maybe something uh something that uh, will survive the post at least i literally have all do you remember that scene in a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy where the the whale is just falling through the air yes yeah and it's like this is it's about that point that the whale started to become sentient and believe and start thinking about what it was trying to do and why it was falling (laughs) yeah exactly why was it a potted plant i'm literally like and it's about that time the milk began to think why why should I become yogurt now? No, maybe now. <laughs> exactly. Yes, I'm going to become yogurt. Splat. I love it. You see the existential questions that come from an episode of the Umbrella Academy. We're <laughs> on to our discussions about the second episode. Hopefully, you've heard our first episode discussion about the show. This episode, we're going to be talking about episode two, the Frankel footage of season yeah, two. Yeah, this is a double header. It is. Yes, yes. But just because we're releasing them a lot quicker, rather than uh, rather than covering two episodes within one episode, we're going to separate them out and have them as two separate episodes. So you know what to do. Make sure you head over to patreon.com slash TV podcast industry where you can support us for just one dollar. I was going to say a book because I like the sound of a book. Mm. I don't know you Americans. Book sounds better than a dollar. <laughs> dollar dollar bill, y'all. Um, but you can support us for that. Of course, uh, in these crazy times, if you don't have any cash to spare, do not worry. We completely understand. You can support us by going over to uh, tvpodcastindustries.com and making sure that you Go and follow us, share the podcast, like, send a review. Uh, we are on every good and evil podcast catcher around the world, mm-hmm. but you can also find us on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, everywhere, Spotify. Where is a podcast? We were there. Yeah, but if yeah. we're not, then go speak to Derek because he organizes that. Well, one of my favorite new ones that we've, that we're on is Pod Chaser. I'm really enjoying that platform. They've done a great job, but it just seems like uh, everybody kind of stuck in uh, Google and Apple and Spotify. But check out Pod Chaser if you haven't uh, checked it out. They've got a really good uh, mechanism of, of kind of pairing together podcasts, much better than most of the others, kind of able to find some podcasts that I've, I wouldn't be able to find anywhere else. It's a really good platform. Absolutely. Okay. And of course, if you are in the business of time travel, like number five, then we will broadcast nicely over an FM frequency. <laughs> (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> maybe, maybe. Maybe at this stage with 505 episodes now, 504 episodes now, I should be able to set up a radio channel that just broadcasts us all day and all night talking about talking Oh my about the God. It'd be like those like 24 hour chill beats on YouTube. There you go. It'd yeah, just yeah. be 24 hours of crazy Chris and his gang. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just changing. I'm just changing the thing. Like, I'm just giving the audience what they want. I love okay? it. I love it. And uh, we are releasing fake news. Uh, <laughs> we are releasing these episodes a bit earlier over on Patreon. And what we're hoping to do is when we release them to our main feed on TV Podcast Industries, add in any thoughts you have about the episodes of the shows. Uh, email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com with your thoughts about any of the episodes of Umbrella Academy Season 2. We'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. We're lucky enough to be watching them a little bit in advance. So uh, these are all our thoughts, unspoiled by anybody else so, uh, so that's hopefully a good thing uh, there's some crazy stuff that's going on in this season i think a little bit crazier uh, even than season one so uh so i'm intrigued to see what uh, everybody thinks of it when these episodes come out uh in the uh, on the 31st of july um so i'm really intrigued to hear what all of your thoughts are um let's get into our discussion about the first episode uh of this podcast episode two the frankel footage so derek do you want to tell us who directed and wrote this episode absolutely the episode was written by mark goffin uh, he was a staff writer on the west wing and then worked his way all the way up through shows like elementary and bull uh, he worked on season one of uh, of umbrella academy as well so he is back for season two um this is his first episode in in season two that he's written the episode was directed by someone we've probably talked about more than almost anybody else in all of our shows Stephen Sergic who directed episodes of every single one of the Marvel Defenders shows including the Defenders and the Punisher so uh, been involved in so much of the work that we've done over the last five years so much of the shows that we've covered over the last five years I think if he'd done an episode of Picard and Watchmen and maybe uh, Penny Dreadful City of Angels I think they're the only ones that he's missed out on so great to have him back here and there's definitely some touches in here that you see the style that Sergic brings to, to these shows I'm sure we'll mention them as we go through the episode uh, he did direct the kind of season one two parter as, as i call it the uh, the day that wasn't and the day that was um where everybody's kind of catching back up on things that they had done wrong and it all gets reset and it goes again on the same day with different perspectives on it so uh, so that was one, that was his touch he directs both episode two and episode three of this season so back to back episodes again uh, really good to see him back here coming up he will be jumping into the world of the witcher so something quite different for <laughs> Stephen Sergio. but we have covered the witcher season one on our podcast and we are definitely going to be covering season two as well so excited to see what he's going to be doing because he's going to get the opening two episodes of season two of the witcher as well which is going to be really interesting to see what he does in that universe no definitely he is one of our most prolifically discussed directors as you say and he brings that style once once you know it's him you can pick out oh well yeah because he he uses that shot and he definitely has it you know the way you would say cameron has a style and mo most directors after a certain period of time you were able to you can kind of like it's a michael bay film has lens flare right yeah it's kind of that kind or of Abrams, like yeah. everyone has that trademark mm -hmm. and his is usually just very uh well choreographed and kind of directed fights at the same time as very i would say strange angles mm-hmm he has um, some really good touches, and there's there's a, a reference in one of these episodes that I think he put in there on purpose that we'll talk about uh, as we go into the episode. John, yeah. do you want to give us the synopsis for this episode of uh, of Umbrella Academy, Season 2, Episode 3? Sure. An incident at the carousel bar leads Luther to Vanya. Five finds an unsettling surprise in the film Hazel left in his pocket, and the cops come after Alison's husband, Raymond Chestnut. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was an interesting idea, having the cops come after him, even though it was Alison that used, uh, that basically took care of the racist dude that tried to, uh, tried to stop them from having their meeting in episode one. Uh, kind of, uh, intriguing that she didn't use her power as well. So, uh, I'm sure we're going to find out much more about that. The way we cover our episodes is we choose a big moment, uh, from the episode each and we talk around it uh, and hopefully cover off everything that happens within the episode. Where are we going to start? Who wants to kick us off with their big moment for the episode? Chris, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, very much mine is Hargreaves is alive and kicking butt, mm -hmm. but at least Pogo, who is slightly younger, is wear still wearing pants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's not; he hasn't gone full three piece yet. He's still just in pants, but yep. he's he's working his way up. Little baby um, Pogo is this? Is this the baby Yoda of uh, of the Umbrella Academy universe? I don't know, but I think so. It I was like, be. oh my yeah. god, he looks so cute. Mm -hmm. 
and then he scratches the hell out of uh, number five. <laughs> um, this very very quickly for me, this was a nice kind of twist. Mm-hmm. Um, quickly breaking it down, what we can see is number five finds the Franco footage, which was left in his pocket by uh, Hazel. Mm-hmm. Uh, he then gets it kind of done out done and fixed he finds diego he uh, comes back they view it they find that their dad is there um basically uh, the footage itself seems to be some we- from it's said in the future it's the day jfk is attempted to be assassinated or is assassinated in mm-hmm. this case um and it's looking it's kind of like a tourist who a wife is filming her husband and they're arguing over camera angles and lighting yep. and oh my god you're not pointing it directly typical <laughs> husband wife stuff absolutely um as you know everyone uh, anyone who's married knows you, or long term relationship you will argue over the silliest things mm-hmm. if it's on camera uh, <laughs> and then they what they do is they pause it think you would have as an audience, we're like, oh my god, they're seeing like the grassy knoll shooter or something. But actually, in fact, they see what is their father. Yes. Reginald Harris Graves is alive and in Dallas in that future point. Mm-hmm. They find him. He's not listed. He's not listed under the Dallas phone book. But the, the Umbrella Academy that uh, he formed in the 1800s when he arrived on Earth uh, is uh, in the... Um, it does have a company there or an office. They go. Uh, it doesn't look like it's been used. It's a front. It hasn't been used in years mm-hmm. from the level of dust. Um, they are separate where they separate. This is Diego and five. Uh, five is confronted by Pogo mm-hmm. after finding something about uh, it's an invitation to a Spanish embassy or something like that or yes. an embassy party. Yes. So they know where their father's going to be uh, in the future is kind of the thing. Uh, so there is some way of tracking him down uh, yes. in the future from the information they found there. Uh, just to mention, I do love the line between Diego and Five. I wonder if there's some kind of magical, timey wimey way to find someone in the past. <laughs> Here's a phone book. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> really that. Good, love that. Really good moment. There. Love that. Um, and then um, Diego stalks his father who uh, quickly runs away, or what we think is running away, Mm -hmm. when in fact it's luring him to a abandoned warehouse with cool lighting. Uh Uh-huh. Because why not? Uh, To be fair, I'm just, as a quick aside, if I'm going to do death-defying martial arts stunts and have a fight to the death, Mm -hmm. I'm going to do it in an abandoned warehouse where there is cool lighting. With edit. I think that's, we have to, we all have to make an agreement now. If we're ever going to do like a three-way fight, Mm -hmm. To the death, it has to be done and filmed at night with light pouring in from broken windows, just to really give it that je ne sais quoi. I guess that'll be our thousandth episode. I didn't okay, get yeah. that it was an abandoned warehouse at all. I just thought, it oh, was, yeah. I just thought it was, it was beside, a warehouse was right next to because it was a business. Place. Well, the whole business is abandoned. Is going to be, so yeah. I guess it's an abandoned warehouse. Yeah. But like, <laughs> oh, but it's broken windows and everything, and there's like random uh, rebar kind of just sticking out mm-hmm. of crates. Yeah. Well, yeah. That was so cool. Like Diego was just about to stick his father with the with the rebar that he had in his hand, and uh, we see Hargreaves sticking him in the belly with uh, with that hidden knife that he uses and calling Diego an amateur. <laughs> it's like that's yeah. really cool. There was a moment earlier on in the episode I was wondering whether it was actually Reginald Hargreaves or maybe this was five that had gone back in the past because we know he was an old man. He was in his uh, late fifties uh, at this time when he was in the past. So I was wondering whether the reveal was going to be he'd take off his hat and it's five, but this is definitely. A de-aged Colin Fior from the first series who yeah. played uh, who played uh, Reginald Hargreaves. It's definitely him. Uh, when we get the, into that fight, we see it from Diego's perspective, and it's definitely their father. But I just w- I was wondering whether it would just be something like Five was hiding himself and pretending he was Hargreaves uh, until that moment. But yeah, uh, yeah. and dare I say it, uh, Diego got a daddy shank. <laughs> he did get a daddy shank. Yeah. Oh God, <laughs> that's not something you want to hear. No, exactly. Um, but. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it was, the fight was great, though. Yeah. Yeah, the fight was, I loved it. Um, and the put down by Reggie, um, to, uh, to, to Diego uh-huh. was, was good, but certainly, uh, yeah, I thought that was good, but it's still like the mystery of what's he doing there. Why has he, it feels like he's drawn them in in some respects, even though that's probably not the case mm-hmm. for sure, but, uh, because he's on that Frankel film. Yeah. Um, so yeah. 
That's... He doesn't know. He doesn't know about his kids. That's exactly. the main thing. Yeah, yeah. Because it's so far in the past. Yeah. Or his future. Uh, oh, time. <laughs> um, but for me, so this is the bit I was talking about. It's very noticeable. The fight scenes, the choreography. That this is a um, Stephen joint. Mm-hmm. Uh, it did like reminiscent of Iron Fist fights, mm-hmm. Electra fights, Daredevil fights. Um, of course, Diego does his superhero jumps and landings, and Certainly. it looks great. Yeah. Um, so for me, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to go slightly faster. Uh, this was what I enjoyed. Um, this is the element of the Umbrella Academy. It's, you've got, usually you've got a mystery. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's always why the apocalypse is going to happen. Exactly. Like we, it's, so it was like, and it's usually just one small clue that leads them on the way. Mm-hmm. Season one, we had the eyeball. Season two, it's the Franco footage yep. with um, Hargreaves. Mm-hmm. So this is the where we start to become, the, we, we get drawn into this web of intrigue. And it's not even a web. It's a, it's a winding river of just craziness. <laughs> yes, but it's, it is an interesting idea. And I'm, I'm trying to, you know, trying to piece it together, obviously, as we see, as you mentioned, Chris, uh, that five does pick up the invitation. So he knows where Hargreaves may be in the future, which allows them to keep tracking him down. They've obviously uh, spooked him from a little bit anyway, not too much because he thinks they're amateurs, but they've spooked him a little bit. So he may not be going back to the, uh, the business again, but they do know where he's going to be in the future. There is that lovely touch just at the end as he walks away and you see Pogo coming out of the building, coming down, grabbing him by the hand and the two of them walk off. Yeah, that, I dark. like that. <laughs> it's a great touch. But, uh, but one thing to mention as well, obviously Pogo's not, not vocal here. Um, Pogo's very no. well educated in the future. Uh, we see him kind of leading the family. He's been around for, with all of them since they were kids. Um, and he's, very intelligent in the future, whereas this Pogo seems to be uh, very new to wearing pants, I suppose, <laughs> and, and maybe the intelligence and the speech level hasn't caught up yet because he yeah. like, he says nothing to anybody. So, um, and I, I I love that um, in this. I, I love the abandoned business with all the mannequins, mm. the dust. It really kind of felt about like. Um, it, it, it is that reference to those kind of nineteen fifties, nineteen sixties experimental kind of labs or something mm-hmm. where you know that we've seen in so many um of those tv shows from from back then or have been referenced in in comics or tv like lost with mm-hmm. the bunker yes uh, all that kind of stuff yeah. so for some reason um, my head's going to to the uh, non-existent fourth sequel to uh, indiana jones where he arrives at a nuclear testing place something about a, a fridge where yeah they nuke the fridge I can't really remember. Does that movie exist or is that something in my brain? No, he gets into the fridge. Yeah. 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 Let's forget about that. Okay. But I love that. I love that reference to the, the old kind of dystopian, um, you know, nuclear age yes. kind of experiments um, that, that we've seen so many times. It's, it's really a, a nice little touch. Yeah. Yeah. The painting on the wall where it's the window, the, the painting of the window, mm-hmm. which is, just has a massive kind of mushroom cloud. Yes. It was yeah. just like yeah. it was just yeah. like it was like everything is sweet and it's a nice little home. And then I looked and I was like, "Hold on, wait!" And then you just everything else about that first room is fine, mm-hmm. except in the window there is a painting of the, the the landscape and a big mushroom cloud explosion. Ah, the American like, nuclear ah. family. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice, yeah. nice. Uh, and you're it. right, John. It did it did whack of kind of Fallout, the video game, right. kind of that sixties sugar pop um kind of nuclear age Mm -hmm. yeah i'm wondering what is his business like it seemed like when he arrived in that in that scene back in episode nine of of the first season when he comes from space effectively and sets up this business it seemed like they were going to sell umbrellas (laughs) but 60 years later what is his business now 70 years later what is the business because it feels like they're making some kind of nuclear uh instructional videos or something like that how to survive the apocalypse maybe Um, nuclear uh umbrellas Maybe, maybe. Yeah. So Which is like, a bunker. Drop, stop, drop, and get under your, our umbrella. Get into your bunker, yes. Maybe get under your umbrella. Um, Chris, Have is your that- tinned fruit to the ready and mm-hmm. dried milk. There you go. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, gentlemen, that was my point. Um, really just interesting to see where, where it all lies. Will Diego survive? Mm-hmm. Um, and well, I guess we'll find out in episode three. But, John, what was your big point for episode two? 
Uh, it was hide and seek. It was the tracking down of Vanya by by Luther. Mm. I I really liked yeah. this. I thought it was really a nice little touch, um, and I, I almost kind of a nice little closeout from season one because I think if if you go back to our season one co- uh, coverage, the 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 overview podcast that we did, you know, one of the things I mentioned was just like just none of them deal with Vanya very well yeah. either in what they say or in what they do you know they kind of say one thing and then do the opposite which absolutely uh you know if I was Vanya I'd be there going what the hell and I I kind of really liked how they did this with you know him picking up um the the, the wallet of Sissy's husband um at the carousel club and he you know he sees Vanya picking up uh Carl and um to take back to the farm Mm -hmm. and he goes out there and of course it's all very ominous with the gun on the passenger seat um and so on and i just kind of like the whole sort of look of this with the barn on the kind of crest of the the rise and you have vanya playing hide and seek with uh harlan sissy's kid Mm -hmm. and um I, i just kind of like how he comes in and ultimately uh, ends off uh, with him uh, apologizing to Vanya. I mean, you do get the feeling he's going to take her out as yeah. a threat. Yeah. And certainly it would be the time to do it, given that she doesn't know who she is. Um, but, you know, he says, I let you down. Um, yeah. And I, I just kind of liked this whole aspect that they, they kind of have taken this through from season one, yeah. potentially closed it off. So we'll see how things develop between these two and the rest of them through the rest of the season. But I thought it was really good. And I, I really kind of liked the fact that Sissy came up with her uh, badass shotgun because she's, you know, and with her phrase, um, next time use the front door mm-hmm. kind of thing when he says, well, I've brought your husband's wallet. Um, but this is kind of as well, this is this first clue for Vanya of knowing that about other people who are her brother or or know her. Exactly. And, you know, this is this first kickoff moment. And it, it does trigger her um, her memories uh, in her dreams or whatever, uh, which sees her heading out uh, of the, the farmhouse um that evening Mm -hmm. so you know something's been triggered within vanya through this meeting with luther but i just kind of like the fact that he ultimately um recognizes that he was a bit of a shit towards her yeah absolutely um it's it's kind of an interesting way they're handling this season as well i like that they were all dropped spread across time and as we're going through the episodes here, we're, each of them are finding different members of the family. So five found Diego and found Luther. Luther now found Vanya as well. Um, so you're going to see how the rest of the cast are all finding each other uh, over this time period that's been spread out. I just think it's a really good mechanism to be it, able to use for the season, isn't it? Exactly. I, I think it's, um, you know, season one was just showing how dysfunctional yeah. they were. And this is kind of them getting to know one another again mm. in different ways or getting to know themselves yeah. you know and so it's really it is it's a great storytelling mechanism yeah. that they're trying to piece together again their relationships with one another yeah um and i i think it's a really good way of doing it and i just like this for luther because yeah. i did i was there saying he was the least um he was the one that least connected with me i thought mm-hmm. the performance was great all that and you know in terms of that but because of how he treated vanya um you're just like going you're real shit yeah like dipshit well like it's the fact that he lost all of his confidence throughout season one yeah. he was supposed to be the leader of this team he was supposed to get all everything put upon him he's supposed to tell everybody what to do nobody's listening to him anyway but by the end of the season he realizes actually there was loads of stuff being hidden from him as well even though he was supposed to be the one with all the information to allow him to lead this team so it even shows in this at the start of this episode when five saying to him you're number one he's going there is no number one there's no umbrella academy there's none of you guys i've been here on my own for a year i'm making a life for myself it's not a great life but he's making a life for himself without any of them around so he's really reluctant to go back and see them all so i like that he's not trying to recruit vanya when he goes to meet her he's going to her just to apologize or kill her one or the other depending on depending on whether he finds out uh, that she remembers everything but he's pretty he's pretty convinced by that conversation that she doesn't remember anything at all so he's going to let her live out her life and walk away and just at least apologize to her which i thought was a a good choice for the character yeah for me it, this was the confirmation to the question we had last episode which was was she faking is she faking mm-hmm. 
this, uh, like the the dream sequence where she starts to remember, that is the proof that no, 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 she does have or she she did have amnesia. Now, how much she's starting to remember mm-hmm. is going to be is it morphs to that question, yeah, exactly. Which is how much will she remember over each of the individual episodes? I really like that she has such a small amount of memory and they have that conversation as well. Yeah, I think that's really good. Now, John, the one thing I think is going to be really interesting based on your kind of point is when they some of the others start to meet Vanya. Uh, as yeah, because yeah. you got to remember, Vanya slit Allison's throat, mm-hmm. yeah, and to, to essentially kill her, yeah. But this isn't that Vanya, and this is not that Allison. Exactly, no. they're not the 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 Allison who basically was who is married. The Allison who mm-hmm. is essentially living and uh, a life away from the Umbrella Academy, and the Vanya who doesn't remember. Slitting Alison's throat, yeah. the Vanya who is good, yeah. who does not remember her past life. What's going to happen when those two meet now? Absolutely. Like, that's going to be interesting. Absolutely. Like, I don't know. At the end of season one, it was Alison that was trying to say that she'll step in the way and the rest of the family kind of jumped Vanya. But you're absolutely right. Diego, as well, is someone that I'm intrigued to see what his uh, opinion is or what happens to him when he meets Vanya because he was very willing to just pull out the knife and kill her, basically. So uh, so will he be the most uh, likely to attempt to kill Vanya uh, as the season goes on, whether he meets her? So uh, really intriguing. Yeah. Yeah. Any, anything else on this yeah. point, John? No, I, I think that's it, really. I, I think um, you know Luther seems to be the one kind of struggling uh, a lot. You know, mm-hmm. even though, you know, Klaus, Allison, um, and Diego, they all don't know whether the others are alive. You know, they've all kind of made a life for themselves uh, in some way. Luther feels that with the ramifications of what happened in season one, you know, the whole thing with the moon and his dad and, and, and all of that, he is the one that seems to be, um, just struggling with this, this new, reality for himself mm-hmm. i mean even down to the fact that you know, he's still insistent that he wants nothing to do with num- number five's plan um and, and you know in, in a sense the kind of almost pointless nature of what he's doing with the fighting and um, which is just to throw the fights yeah. so that his boss makes money um it, it it all seems a little you know he he's lost um at sea effectively yeah. here and, and he's struggling to find that that port in in which to dock uh, so to speak and i feel like this is kind of the first part of that you know of him trying to make peace for himself so that he can sort of get better but it so i think i I just thought it was nice i think it was a nice look back to to the the first season with how vanya was kind of treated really by Mm -hmm. all the the other members of the seven and um and really you know it's it's a new kind of relationship that's developing as they reconnect and so i i like that yeah yeah absolutely i like that a lot (laughs) Derek, what's your massive point for this episode? It is a massive point because it's the opening of this episode. I absolutely loved the return of the handler <laughs> because I said it, I said at the top of our discussion here that there's some things that I think are even crazier this season than, than they were in season one. They certainly upped the craziness with the return of the handler. Um, I love that it opened up with the two guys about to put her into the uh, into the fire, and she kind of makes a little movement, and uh, one of the guys goes, "Oh no, someone that someone that farted all the way into the furnace last time." And you're kind of wondering because he doesn't seem very perceptive. You're kind of wondering was that person alive as well? <laughs> just yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? But um, a beautifully delivered uh, line from the handler. Going, Gushby to um, the hospital, uh, maybe laugh out loud. That <laughs> was ju- just the way that was done was mm-hmm. so funny. And of course, just yeah, the school kid in me, you know, intestinal gas, farts, you yeah. know, what is not to like about uh, a bit of um, gassy humor, mm-hmm. to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> but she has. I'm just so happy she's back. She's such a great character. I love that they start her out here where she's just been completely stripped of all of her authority. There's no respect given to her at all. She returns to uh, to the commission effectively, walks in through the door and everybody's kind of whispering about her. And then everybody just completely ignores her. I love that she does that thing where she flips off her coat and holds it out waiting for somebody to take the coat from her. <laughs> yeah, and hang absolutely. And nobody does. And then... As if the idea that a person who got shot in the brain with a bullet uh, coming back to life was, wasn't was enough 
uh, to ask a new audience or the audience coming into season two, we have the appearance of Carmichael, a, a comic book character who was the leader of the commission. He's the one that actually used to give five his jobs, effectively. Carmichael is a comic book character. Um, I think they call him AJ in this episode. Yeah. Um, but he's effectively a fishinable, smoking fishinable, a talking smoking fish in a bowl. <laughs> a bureaucratic smoking fish head in a bowl. <laughs> Who wears a hat? Who yeah, wears a hat? <laughs> so good. Um, I absolutely love the character design here. I love what they've done with it. The, the guys who, who did the CGI of the lip sync of this fish to his to how he talks. Because I was watching it wondering whether it's just a fish kind of doing the kind of bob bob as he, as he talks. But they have genuinely matched his vocals to uh, yeah, to the fish mouth. Know. And then he takes a cigarette <laughs> yeah. um, and blows smoke rings inside his fish bowl. <laughs> Hilarious. So good. And wondering whether this will have a lot of people going hang on a second <laughs> this, is, <laughs> Absolutely. this is so much more to take than the first season do you, do you think that aj then could really sissy that walk and, <laughs> and slay the lip sync for his life on rupaul because I, uh, I did i thought it was so good the whole chit chat between him and uh the handler mm-hmm. uh, and just the moment as well when herb is revealed to be her new oh. <laughs> supervisor kind of that whole thing of you you can just sense the build up in it, and it just the whole release of it when she sees number five's nameplate mm-hmm. at a desk, yeah. um, and and yeah. just being flung uh, towards uh, Herb, uh, so good. I what don't, what a kind of put down, absolutely. Really. But I also love Herb, but he feels like every normal office worker who's gotten a promotion, someone that probably doesn't feel he deserves it, but has been working really hard for years. You know, we heard that he was working on one problem for three and a half years last season. That's why the handler hates him, because he's pretty useless at his job, but he's been promoted. Um, so he has that little bit of confidence that comes from the promotion as well. So uh, he walks into the room and, and uh, effectively says he's her boss. And she, her response is basically, I've dropped bigger turds than someone like her. <laughs> and he immediately goes, oh, you need more fiber then, thinking he's hilarious. <laughs> so uh, so those two definitely not going to work very well together. I love the other co-worker, the one that used to sit beside uh, Five, um, trying to be really nice to the handler as she comes to sit down, saying, you know, if you want to go out for lunch sometime, we can uh, we can go out for lunch today. There's some fun stuff on the canteen. Uh, handler, very unhappy in her situation, uh, telling her, if you speak to me one more time, I'm going to staple you to a wall. <laughs> so, uh, so, yeah, love this situation where you have someone that was so much in charge of everything that went on, knew everything that was going on through history, really, because that was her whole job and had such a powerful position. And now because of Five, because of Chacha and Hazel, uh, going rogue almost in the last uh, last season she's got nothing left but she's kind of asking for an opportunity so what we see towards the end of the episode is that she seems to be back in the 60s uh, and walking into um possibly meet an earlier version of aj possibly meet uh, some some of the fish in that uh, in that pet store that she goes into so yeah that that was my thing i was like as soon as i saw more goldfish mm-hmm. i was like <gasps> She's gonna go in and kill her, they kill him, and then that's probably him from the past. So then yeah. he doesn't become a sentient, and then oh my god! And yeah, that was that was the fun. <laughs> I, I I the reason we are friends, and I'm gonna put this out where the reason we're all friends, and the reason I had the same two thoughts. Mm-hmm. One, I went, wait, are they actually sinking the lips? And I paused it yep. at live and went, oh, they are. <laughs> yeah, sweet. <laughs> and then straight went from lip sync to. Oh, John's going to want them to do a lip sync battle. Oh my God, <laughs> Literally, that was my thought process. And I went, I love it. Yeah, that, yeah. Now you just said that. I'm like, yeah, God, that's this, exactly what This I'm confirms yeah. why we're all friends. I love it. I Absolutely. Love it. Uh, but yeah, the visit to the to visit to the pet store, just quickly, because you have put out one question already that isn't actually the pub quiz question. But my other question for the episode is what did the handler say to the little boy to make him pee his pants about fish and make him run out of the shop? What was it that she said to him? <laughs> so if you have an answer to that, send that into us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com because I'd love to know what the hell it was that you said. 42. <laughs> there are 42 children. <laughs> no, no, just 42. Okay. It's just the, the answer to everything. It's the answer to... She just, <laughs> just, just, she just said, the world, it means nothing. It's just 42. <laughs> what? What's 42? <laughs> I can't imagine. It has to be something else. It's probably something like I come from a place where those fish eat humans or something. Or maybe it's that. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I know who know. you're going to be. You're going to grow up old and alone by yourself. You won't marry. You won't have kids. Blah, 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 blah. Maybe. Like if she, someone tells you your whole future yeah. uh, as a kid. 
That make or stuff, yeah. there is no Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I can't believe you've spoiled that for everybody. Um, but it's just great to see Hamlet back. That's my uh, that's my big point for the episode. Um, any other uh, mentions of where everybody else is for this episode? Anything that we have missed out on that you guys want to talk about? Yeah, um, I've I've got, well, it's kind of in notes, I suppose. But I've got the whole many put downs of Diego. Oh, um, yes. So Diego and Leela do kind of team up here. They also share a, a little little snog with one another so that they don't get caught by the police. But they are on the run together, and they have kind of. Uh, teamed up here mm-hmm. but um there are some great put downs of diego poor diego and um, first from number five uh which is imagine batman then aim lower um <laughs> as he's sat in, as he's kind of transported into the back seat of this car that diego and lila have stolen mm-hmm. and then he, of course he tries to blow their cover as well because uh, Diego kind of doesn't want anything to do with number five, given that he didn't rescue him when he could. So yeah. um, I, I do kind of like that. And even Leela, his kind of new little uh, sidekick uh, here, um, she, <laughs> you know, it, they have this conversation about um, who they are, where they come from. And she goes, you are an open book. Um, you know, she knows him very well. And she goes, you're an open book, Diego, for very dumb children. <laughs> it's just like um, he cannot yep. uh, hide his intention or feelings uh, yep. very well at one all. Of my, one of my lines um, of the episode, really. It's, uh, it's just that idea that, you know, he thinks that he is almost Batman. He thinks he has this epic <laughs> exactly. backstory that makes him who she, who he is. And she's like, no, no, you're just a boy with daddy issues trying to prove to his dad that you're the hero. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> your dad hasn't even been born yet or doesn't even know who you are yet. Sorry, his dad has obviously been born. And but, and then um, just yeah. the critique then, as, as was mentioned in the fight between him and Reggie, mm-hmm. um, amateur. Like, amateur, yes. Oh, <laughs> so good. What a burn. <laughs> I am going to use that. You are an open book for very dumb people. Yeah, I think that's uh, really good. Dumb children. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I, that's that is my clap back now. That from <laughs> now on, I think I think I'm so, going to like Lila. I think she's uh, she's got some good character about her uh, to to watch throughout the rest of the season. Um, one character we didn't really mention much in this episode was Allison. Um, you know, we we mentioned early on in the in the synopsis that uh, Ray gets arrested and and bought, brought to prison, and she doesn't use her rumor ability. She says something, uh, has that moment where the police officer's eyes turn white because uh, he hears the instruction she's about to give him and then she stops and doesn't use her power. So that was an interesting little moment there. Um, but we also have Clayson in prison because he finished the episode last episode just getting arrested and going to prison. He meets one of his uh, one of his cult members, I guess, who uh, who uh, has the tattoos on yeah. both hands, like Kichi, uh, Kichi. Kichi, that's it. Uh, he has the hello goodbye tattoos that uh, that Klaus has on his hands. So uh, a member of his organization and. Clice bumps into Ray, Allison's uh, husband, uh, in the prison. So, uh, so a nice little connection there as well. Yeah. So another person finding at least someone connected to uh, one of the other members of the seven of, of the of the Umbrella Academy. So, uh, so I love that that he's got Kichi talking to him, asking him, you know, for some words of wisdom, and he give, he delivers TLC's <laughs> waterfalls yeah, to him, absolutely, <laughs> which is a great little moment, uh, and then. Almost immediately trying to get away from Kichi, he uh, talks to Ray and Ray gives him another piece of wisdom. So uh, almost as if Klaus is looking for his own guidance and his own leader. Yeah, exactly. I, I kind of like the idea here that in, in Klaus's guru or prophet, um, we really see what and uh, on how he's gotten to that point, <laughs> which is um, a lot of unreferenced uh, steals yeah. from o- other people from the future, uh, which I I thought was was really really good course, um, in typical Klaus, Klaus yeah. fashion. I exactly, reckon. such a Klaus thing, such a Klaus thing. Uh, last people we need to talk about, I think, uh, from the episode are the Swedes themselves, because uh, we do get a really interesting scene where they go and find their accommodation uh, for <laughs> for where they're going to be based in uh, in Texas um, when they meet their new landlord who tells them there's only one room available and the next time you see her, it's just her head in the freezer. <laughs> so uh, I thought that was very interesting. Um, once I, another, another great thing that we see in the show right throughout the first season uh, is this idea that the commission know where their assassins are at all times. So they're is always a pipe available with their instructions for the assassins. I love, you hear the noise, and then everybody kind of looks around the room to find out which which wall they have to open to pick out their their message. I think it's a really cool uh, idea that uh, that this message will always appear wherever they are. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, 
there's a moment in the house where because they're all kind of dressed as milkmen, um, or one of them is, one of them is at yeah. least, and yeah. they've they've stolen a milk van, uh, where he it seems like he's drinking weird milk, mm. um, like. It looks CGI. It was kind of silvery, yeah. uh, kind of... It, and lumpy. It looked lumpy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's potentially whatever gives them something. Yeah. Like, they yeah. don't seem overpowered. They don't seem super powered. But they also but, don't seem human. Yeah, they don't stuff. seem normal. Exactly. Yeah. They yeah. don't seem... So maybe they're machine sweets. Yeah. Maybe they're robot like, assassins. Like, <laughs> I, I don't know. Robot the, assassins, the, Chris. Go for robot assassins. Always yeah. cool. No, because I want to stick with the sweet. So they, oh my god, they're IKEA assassins. So this is just the oil, the the, the glue, the grease to keep them moving. So the <laughs> IKEA well, based assassins. Well, that's what I was Swedish thinking. Swedish meatballs. I was like, that's weird that they've chosen to make that pint of milk, that bottle of milk, yeah. kind of look kind of slightly. Uh, dare I say it? Oh, 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 yeah, silvery, sort of grayish and lumpy. Uh, when I so I I wondered what it was. Was it just it had yeah. gone off and was really grim? Yeah. Uh, but he didn't care, or yeah, like some kind of special potion that I they think, need. Yeah, I think it's some kind of special potion or some kind of special thing to keep them on on their game. Uh, but just wanted to mention them in this episode because I just thought it was a, a very funny and scary scene as they uh, obviously remove the head of the landlord uh, to get an extra room uh, in her house. <laughs> um, any final notes about the episode that we haven't talked about? Um, I've just got kind of one, which is in relation to the Frankel footage film, which mm-hmm. is obviously of um, the JFK assassination. And in this one, we see um, uh, we see Sir Reggie yeah. Hargreaves there uh, on on the sort of grassy knoll, so to speak, uh, with with the allowed. umbrella. Yeah, you would not be allowed in the academy if you keep calling him Reggie. No, exactly, <laughs> um, <laughs> Sir Reggie. And um, I, I, but you know, this is this is a nod to the Zapruder. Uh, film that was taken of the JFK assassination, and mm-hmm. um, you know, used in the Kevin Costa movie and used in the whole investigation of it. So, yeah, in just real ca- life, yeah. yeah, in real life. So, just to you know, it, I, I was kind of I'd forgotten what the footage was called, and I was thinking it was the Frankel yeah. footage, but it, it is the Zapruder uh, footage uh, and film that that was taken there on an eight millimeter uh, camera. Yeah. I also thought as soon as the Frankel footage, I couldn't stop. Uh, saying Frankenfurter, right. Dr. Frankenfurter. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Because yeah. so the big difference is the Saprita footage in real life is the one that's supposed to prove there was a shooter on the grassy knoll, uh, not from the book depository, not the yeah. Harvey Oswald. Exactly. That's what the investigation was. So exactly as I said, even when I saw the episode name being this, I was like, oh, okay, well, they're going to discover who the other shooter was. That's what it is. But this isn't the same footage. This is a couple arguing on the same day, and it's the one that points out that their father is there. So there is still... There's a pretty of footage out there. Exactly. Somebody else is also filming that day. So. And speaking of Dr. Frankenfurter from the Rocky Horror Picture okay. Show, I just feel that I think it's because of Klaus. Mm-hmm. I think um, Klaus would be Dr. Frankenfurter. I certainly think he or would be. Or they would be really good friends. <laughs> Very likely. Very likely. Very likely. Yeah, I think so. That's anyway. it for notes for the episode. Chris, anything you want to add? Nothing from my side. Okay. Um, I, I just want to discuss our next episode. Okay, what did you think of the episode overall? So I love this. See, uh, episode two was the perfect kind of. It set up a few more questions. So, do who? Why is the handler back? How did she survive? We get all these answers. Uh, essentially, it's also like, where are we going next? And it's it's. Just, it's I keep using the chess analogy at the moment. <laughs> I know. Um, but it's fun. It, it, it makes sense. You can use checkers. Uh, so if, you can use American football. You can use loads Okay, of so options. let's go. The opposition, uh, the the, uh, the offensive line is it's kind of there now. Mm-hmm. The defensive backers are being set in place. We're going to get a, a running play, mm-hmm. um, but it's probably going to end in a sack right. for the commission. And then they're going to need to use a Hail Mary in the future. Yep. Love it. Yes. Love it. John, what did you think of this episode? Yeah, I really enjoyed this. Um, I'd give it four intestinal farts out of five, although <laughs> uh, I suppose there's not many other types of farts, really. Probably not. Um, but uh, I, I really liked it. Um, I loved uh, the handler coming back um, and AJ, mm-hmm. the bureaucratic fish head. <laughs> um, I think that was just really good. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, the whole kind of mystery around... 
um, Sir Sir Reggie Hargreaves uh, and his kind of front of uh, of a business uh, was really good. I love that kind of vibe um, uh, of number five and Diego going to his business and it kind of being abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was just really good. And again, just the development of all the the members of the academy um, that. Uh, yeah, I just, I, I just, it's a really, really um, great build on episode one, and, and I, in particular, I just really like the kind of delicate touch of uh, Luther tracking Vanya down and kind of just putting it on that knife edge of between, you know, is he going to shoot her or 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 not? I mean, you do think he is, but then he kind of pulls back and. Uh, and it realizes that he's has something that he needs to apologize for to mm -hmm. Vanya, uh, given the events of season one. Um, so yeah, I, I thought this was a really good, uh, second episode. Uh, I can't, can't wait really to get further into the, the show, to be honest. Yeah. yeah, absolutely loving the mechanism of having everybody apart and just each individual member finding people in different ways and finding partners of people and finding the family that Vanya is connected with. You know, all of that stuff, I think, is a really good mechanism to have a different type of show than we had in season one. But having Diego and Five work together is really good. Having uh, Luther and Vanya meeting up with each other, having just simply uh, Klaus meeting Ray for the first time, meeting the husband of Alison, I think is a, a nice little touch in the episode. Um, and yes, the Swedes are, uh, are absurdly interesting. That, uh, that uh, knife fight that they have, which doesn't particularly go quite well, uh, probably shows you that they're uh, very different to normal humans uh, in, in the episode. Um, and we also have the return of the handler and the introduction of AJ. So uh, yeah, really, really interesting stuff. I'm really excited for to talk about the next episode. We've got one last piece of business before we get out of our discussion on episode two. John, we're over at the Carousel Club again for our pop quiz pub quiz. Do you want to give us the question for this episode? Yes, uh, fellow brolly dollies. Yeah, the, um, the question for this episode is, what quote does Raymond Chestnut correct Klaus on as they do time together in jail? And from which Shakespeare play is it from Ooh, very good yes. so actually what we're looking for is the correct quote and the play mm -hmm. uh, uh from the shakespeare play from uh from where it's from so uh yeah there we go excellent excellent thanks so much for that john and um, and remember you can send that through to us at feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com um and you each episode send in your feedback just make a note in the subject line that it is the pop quiz pub quiz mm -hmm. uh, for the umbrella academy or you can send them all in in batches whatever you want to do uh, feel free to send it in and there will be some umbrella academy type prizes for the winner well not type prizes some barely academy prizes we found a really good one already uh but we're hoping that it's not out of stock so we're not going to say what it is in case uh in case it gets out of stock exactly by the end of the season so that's it that's the end of our discussion about episode two of the umbrella academy season two thanks so much for joining us make sure you stay subscribed to tvpodcastindustries.com and we'll have the next episode out before you know it <laughs> thanks so much for joining us we'll talk to you again next time see you soon Bye. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us, fellow Brolly Dollies. Remember, keep watching, keep listening, and keep blowing smoke bubbles. <laughs> Bye. Bye.